but I'm going to do an aside. This is kind of an, uh, a beginning to the class. Um, two things. Number one is he talked about, I love a good kenning. <clears throat> Kennings are used, absolutely used in Anglo-Saxon um, writing. But that is not what I would really call a distinguishing feature of Anglo-Saxon writing. It is far more prevalent in Norse writing. Um, if you look at it, though, because people do a kind of comparison, and I've heard the, wow, Anglo-Saxon is a lot primitive when you compare it to this, and I said, yeah, Anglo-Saxon literature verse, starting around 500 AD uh, CE, and going to about, uh, you know, 1066. Norse stuff usually starts in around 1100. Okay, you're talking yeah. about a five, six hundred year difference. Um, so, of course, it's much less formal because it is in a more proto-state. Um, and I'm like, I can guarantee you if we had more extant poetry from uh, early even pre-Viking era, <clears throat> I can guarantee you it'd probably be just as rough, mm -hmm. um, just as wonky. And when I say rough, there is a certain cadence and feel to Anglo-Saxon poetry that is um, very rhythmic and I don't like the word primitive. Um, but it's very so, definitely... I would say it's more suited to war poetry than love poetry. While they do have some things that you could call love poetry... Well, I was going to say, it would be love poetry for certain activities of love. <laughs> um, a lot of this is poetry that would be good for rowing, that would be good for walking, that would be good for writing, um, you know, that is, is good for working. Um, also, good poetry to be doing, drop spindle... Uh, weaving um, all sorts of stuff that has this rhythm. <clears throat> so we'll get into that. Um, are you turning this on now, Kieran? Oh, it's been on. Oh, okay. <laughs> Zooming in. So um, just to, to start out, um, I, I've i always loved Beowulf. I, I think I read Beowulf for the first time when I was in grade school. And the reason I did that is because when I was eight, I read this little book called The Hobbit. And then I got to see the animated Hobbit on TV, which was not the dumpster fire that many people say it was. It was actually pretty true to the book for a made-for-TV uh, comic. And then when I was nine, I read Lord of the Rings. <clears throat> and uh, one of the, the cultures in that book that I really fell in love with was the Rokirum. And so I fell in love with the the, the rhythm and the melody, where now the horse and the rider, where the horn that was blowing. You know, although that all the way isn't really Anglo-Saxon. But, you know, um, ride now, ride now, ride to Gondor. Just... <sighs> so I read Beowulf. And as bad as the translations were, I fell in love with it. Um, so, fast forward a few years, and I got into this role-playing game in which I played a writer of Rohan who was also a bard. And I wanted to do authentic poetry in the role-playing game. And then I realized that all my other fellow people who wanted to do music and, and poems from the people of Rohan were doing it wrong. And it made my skin crawl. I'm like going, no, it's supposed to be alliterated. No, it's not supposed to rhyme. No, no. So I wrote a handbook on how to be a proper bard and how to write proper poetry. And that is how this started. Uh, this handout started in about 2001. Um, and then when I decided to start teaching it in the SCA, I finally pub published it, you know, where I'd pen it out, and that was like 2005 when I finally put it together in more formal form with references and everything. So if you notice, this has all my updates on this, um, but the original 
uh, is all the way back from like 2001 or something like that. So I've been teaching this a while. So, um, I'm just gonna yeah. close that. Cut yes. The noise. So, are we aware of what alliteration is? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I should say, what is your experience? I know everyone's so loud. What is your uh, your experience with alliterative verse or alliteration in general? Uh, it's my favorite form of poetry, but I've not really like studied it in, like historically. Okay. Other than in putting together um, Norse and Anglo-Saxon scrolls for people. Awesome. My laurel is in Old English, the poetry and the language. Oh, wow. So, I just really love hanging out with someone talking about it. Right? <laughs> like, finally can geek yeah. out. So, I'm going to say the other thing is that anything that you're going to hear about Anglo-Saxon or literature verse, take with this huge grain of salt. <clears throat> we have very little extant anything that is written down from Anglo-Saxon times. And a lot of it was written down by monks. Some of them were not favorable to the uh, earlier Anglo-Saxon pagan culture. Um, so that all these things are things that later scholars have gleaned. We don't have a Snorri Strulson who has gone in and told us, no, this is how you need to talk, and this is how you need to do this, and this is how you need to do these kennings. We don't have that. So that all of this is really much gleaned by scholars, a lot of it starting in Victorian era and going forward. Um, I say that because there are debates about some of what you might hear. There are debates about some patterns and stuff you might hear. And it's cool. It's geeking out. But it's also grain of salt. We're looking at the sadly small amount of, of things that we have. That's not good as far as language-wise, but what the heck, it's English. Um, okay, so I don't need to tell you what a literature verse is, but, you know, as, as you've done the scrolls, we're not talking about doing seven silly swans swam silently seaward. Right. Um, we're talking about alliteration on a beat. And the beat is going to be um, Anglo-Saxon verse almost exclusively until later in the period and some religious writings is going to be a four beat line. Caveat number 1200. Much of what we have written down <coughs> is written down line after line after line after line after line after line without any breaks in it and not even necessarily a whole heck of punctuation. So what we have to do is kind of work it out based on context and the alliterative pattern. And also in some cases it's missing because it's old. It got damaged. It got used as a coffee table book. You know, I mean... Like that 1280 piece of art they found in the woman's kitchen. Yeah. It's, it gives me hope that they will find right? more. I They'll find more, right? I keep hoping. The I French always government keep, just put it in the Louvre, like, yesterday. I, I keep my ears up. I hear all these great things about, oh, we found this piece of jewelry. Oh, we found this piece of cloth. Oh, we found this. And I'm like, oh, did you find any writing? Um, so I always, you know, that, that's kind of a, since we have the time to really discuss it, um, take everything that I say with a grain of salt, because I'm doing this based on the research I've done, which is researching what I can read. I, I have an Anglo-Saxon dictionary. I have yet to actually take the time to learn how to pronounce Anglo-Saxon properly. I am ashamed. Um, uh. <laughs> I have gone in and done a, you know, gone and translated some of my own things. <clears throat> One of these days, I will actually have both time and money at the same time to take a, a real class on Anglo-Saxon. 
Um, <clears throat> so basically what it is, this is, uh, if you notice, I have a bibliography in the back. I will skip around on this, so this page, there is a bibliography. These are the sources that I have used. In some of these, I have actually gone and notated them in the, uh, in the text of this handout. Um, in others, it is of a general reading. These are the things that I have gleaned from it, whether or not they were the author's intentions. They are what I took from it. <clears throat> Again, so if you see something and I mention a book but no notation, uh, it is a combination of what is in there versus what I have gleaned from that source. All right. So what we are doing is we are going to alliterate on the stressed beats. <clears throat> Horse and horseman, hoof beats afar, sank into silence, so the songs tell us. Um, if you can hear there, horse and horseman, hoof beats afar. How do we make it Anglo-Saxon? <clears throat> so, um, the first thing is that Anglo-Saxon verse does not originally start out as a written form. We do not have a literate population <clears throat> that we're talking about. Through a huge portion of the Anglo-Saxon period, most of the population is not going to be literate. There are some extant poems um, that are meant to be written down. Um, one of them is a riddle about um, a hen. And the clues for hen are actually written in runes. <clears throat> so you've got both um, Roman style writing or Greek, you know, Greek slash Roman style writing. You've got Roman alphabet writing and Anglo-Saxon futhark, futhark, sorry. Uh, Anglo-Saxon Futhork in the same time period coexisting, at least in relative peace. Um, so some of these are designed to be written. Um, a lot of things you're going to find in the riddles, which we will get to, yay. A lot of those are actually written down by monks. Um, we're given the impression that it was something that uh, they did as a game. You know, not necessarily Bilbo and Gollum's riddle game. Um, but as we see from other mythologies that certain gods like to go and do riddles and things like that. Um, and from what we've seen from the monks, we, and, and, you know, their writings in the riddles themselves, we get the impression that it was something that they would do for fun. You know, we have nothing else to do. Let's do riddles. So, what we're doing here, most Anglo-Saxon doesn't have what we call verses, with some few exceptions. Uh, so what we're looking at here is that, so that we can better understand it, so that we can look at its structure, um, later scholars have broken it into lines. Each line has four stressed beats and a theoretically infinite, but English doesn't really work this way. So a limited but non-set number of unstressed beats. Does that make sense? Um, again, to kind of understand structure, we then break it down into half lines with a caesura, if we're going to be, uh, if we're going to be technical, caesura. Uh, but I just call it break because A, I can pronounce it properly, and B, because it's understandable to those who haven't been studying <clears throat> it for years. We put a break in there. Sometimes there is a break in there. Other times they're not. The reason that we put a break in there is because we've got your first half line here, your second half line here. Two beats here, two beats here. The third beat is the keystone. That is the beat which everything else that you're going to alliterate, that is the one that everything has to alliterate with. So it would be easy if it was the first, the first uh, beat. Because then 
as you're writing it or creating it or singing it uh, offhand, you would just be able to go right ahead and put a word there and then alliterate everything else with that. But no. What they're going to make you do is they're going to make you think ahead all the way to that third stress beat and figure all of that out. So that is how you get your Anglo-Saxon form. Your Anglo-Saxon form is any number of lines broken into half lines with a scissor or break in the middle with the alliteration going on the third beat. Doesn't matter how many lines you have. Um, most, most of these forms do not have choruses. Boom, that's it. Four beats. Boom, 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 boom. Um, there are, there, the one exception that we have found is that in some writing, which mostly tends to be religious, we have found a six beat line. And that is six, um, uh, so it's going to be three, three beats, three beats, same zero in the middle. How that form works, what specifically it was used for, we do not know. Pretty much it has been found exclusively in religious poetry. So, again, there is the posited opinion that is a religious form. Grain of salt. Of the handful of poems that we have in the first place, we have only a small fraction that happens to be in the six, uh, uh, the six beat meter. So I'm able, since y'all actually happen to be more familiar, I can, I'm kind of glossing over as opposed to be going more, um, a little bit, um, more directly on the handout. If by any chance you have any questions, in fact, I will ask right now. Does anyone have any questions, comments, concerns right now? Because feel free to ask at any time. I would just include the term hy hypermetric. So you would know if you come across that term, it means it's one of those long lines. Oh. Thank you. I was not aware of that term. Oh, yes. <laughs> Makes sense, though. I have actually written... <clears throat> I have actually written a um, an Anglo-Saxon style verse for my character in Rohan that happens to be a um, a combination of four beat and six beat lines, um, and it's about the creation of horses, which I figured was appropriate to have a a cadence that would do that because it's it's the Rohirrim, it's the closest thing to a religion that they have. <laughs> is horses. The, the, six, the six beat is much harder to, to compose in. It, so. it is. It is. And honestly, it was more of a sense. And then it was funny because I realized that it was just an instinctive putting it into the six beat. So it was, it was kind of, you know, odd. Um, so again, when we have this, we've got Glory escaping, gathering gloom, harken the hoof beats, harken the horn. Um, again, more not over much, mighty was the fallen. Um, so this is one thing that is important. The beat does not always come on the first syllable of a word. Hello. Someday I will make this class again instead of half the group. That would be cool. That would be weird. Here, have a handout. Thank you. And funny, that alliterates. <laughs> have, a hand. have a handout. Happy we are. Mm. Horribly sorry to be late. <laughs> that is. <laughs> <laughs> this is also, it is how you sometimes end up talking like Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, Next thing, kennings. As I said at the beginning, kennings are not specifically. Did you need a ref, did Did you need a quick roundup? No, I remember. Well, I know what alliteration is, and I know what kennings are. So. 
Okay, so basically we've been discussing the fact that um, Anglo-Saxon literature verse uses a four-beat, uh, mostly uses a four-beat line, uh, two stresses, two stresses, and I will actually get to the patterns later on. Okay. Um, and the important thing that you need to take out of the patterns is that you alliterate based on the third stress in the line. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, all right, kennings. Kennings exist in Anglo-Saxon verse. Kennings are not formalized in any specific way that we are aware of. Kennings are much less creative, um, if you want to use that term. They're much... They're much more simple and practical compared to Norse kennings. Oh. We're, we're not getting things like... So you don't need to know... From what the kennings that we have found in Anglo-Saxon verse, you do not need to be versant in the entirety of Anglo-Saxon mythology to understand this kenning. Yeah. You do not know what Odin had to do to somebody or what Loki was doing that particular day or why exactly Sif was bawling her eyes out or why Freya was either. You don't have to know any of that. You have to know things like Bonehouse. Uh, Bonehouse actually can also be, uh, can also be the body. Yeah, Bonehouse. I was guess that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Linden friend uh, I've seen, which is usually a, a shield. Because uh, usually shields are made out of, of course, you also can have. So shields, a lot of them you'll see linden wood shields and ash spears. Um, so you'll see things like that. Um, I'm blanking right now on the one for male, but there is also a one for male. The ones that you usually see is something like God's Candle. Um, Whale Road and Gannett's Bath um, are also uh, usually used for the ocean. Um, which is, uh, oh, Sea Steed also, you know. You, is so, Gannett a bird? Yeah. Gannett is a bird, yes. Because they're seabirds and so they like to go, just go and, you know, bathe yeah. themselves in the ocean. Because, you know, that salt water just, just wonders for their feathers. <laughs> um... Uh, one one thing that you will hear, and this is a hasten o sea steed down from the whale road, okay? Uh, SCA song, you've all heard it probably, so hasten o sea steed down from the whale road. Those are kennings. So that's like, come on, boat down the water. Hurry boat, yeah, hurry boat down from the sea. Um, themes. What themes do we use in Anglo-Saxon poetry? Everything. <laughs> there is... No particular thing. If you want to be like, you know, stereotypically Anglo-Saxon, war, battle, the heroic ideal. Social relations. <clears throat> Social relations are hugely important in Anglo-Saxon culture. You are talking about a structure that while it is stratified, it is still going to be a lot more egalitarian than later because there are just much fewer layers. And especially because they had migrated and where they were living was not as harsh as say Viking era. But again, we're talking about a land that had been, they'd been uprooted, they'd fought, that come in, that fought. So when you're fighting, you know, you're not necessarily developing these super, 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 super highly complex things in the same way that you're going to. And when I say that, I'm talking about like all these rules of say, what color I can wear, you know. But here's the thing their social structures were actually very interwoven and more complex than you expect. Sister son, that is your nephew. Your nephew is probably, a man's nephew is probably the most important person 
in his life. This person is more important to his security than pretty much anyone other than his 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 people. What about his own son? No. So what happened is that if you had a sister, what it was is that you are going to take your, your son, not necessarily your oldest, but probably the second one, you yeah. know, depending, and you are going to foster him with your sister. Your sister is going to foster her child with you. And the reason that you did this is because it is much easier to build alliances and to not kill each other when you've got your own flesh and blood living in the potential enemy's house. Um, so these were, these were um, relationships that were built. You will see fostering happen. You will see adoptions happen, um, blood brotherhoods, things like that. Um, Aside from things like giving rings, giving land, giving property, giving a title, all of these are actually building the social structure, and you will see this in a lot of the writings as well. If you look at Beowulf, there are a whole bunch of examples in there about dif different kinship. Um, and it's important because when you have a society that is in... I'm not saying it's in upheaval. It had been in upheaval because you're kind of jockeying for where you're going to be. Um, and so you're, you're trying to get position and all that. It's not the most settled time. And so you want to know who you can rely on. And when you're making family ties, you know, you're basically, you're, I mean, let's face it. Basically it's friendly bribing. You're like going, Hey, you know what? I'll marry off my daughter to you if you promise not to kill me. You know, um, Peace Weaver, another Kenning, Peace Weaver, that is literally um, one of the big functions for your, your daughter, is you're going to send off your daughter to be a Peace Weaver with, like, that dude that you were, like, that your dad was fighting with, but, you know, he's got really good land, mm -hmm. so you're going to send your daughter over there, and if things go well, if things go well, yeah. she's not going to, you know, like, kill you. She'll have sons. She'll have too many sons. And so she'll actually, like, you know, those sons will kind of integrate. And, and so basically you're going to cross-pollinate and you're going to get some of their land eventually. On the other hand, if things don't go well, then hopefully you won't have to, like, kill her husband and bring her back. And her son. I'm thinking the Battle of Finsburg. I'm totally <laughs> thinking of the Battle of Finsburg. <laughs> Um, this Battle of Finsburg is a, um, so Beowulf is actually a pretty short story if you're just going with the individual, the actual story of Beowulf. Beowulf likes to go and fight. He likes to do brave things. He goes off, he goes off and decides that he's going to help the Spearedanes because the Spearedanes have a monster problem. He goes, he kills the monster, ticks off the monster's mom, kills the monster's mom, gets all this stuff, goes back home, ends up that his king is not that great of a king, and his kin are even worse at keeping themselves alive. Mm -hmm. So Beowulf should not have ruled, but he ends up ruling. He was a good king, so the songs tell us. And then he fights a dragon and he dies. Oops. <laughs> People are sad. Sad, sad, sad. That is the basic story of Beowulf. Yeah. There are lots of side stories in Beowulf. And one of them is the fight at Finsburg, where basically sends the sister, uh, well, the father sends the, uh, the his daughter off to marry the enemy. And the sister, you know, hmm, and then there are sister sons exchanged back and forth. And then sister's brother goes and kills her husband. And then she has to get her boys to go after her brother because she needs weird guild for their father. And it's just really, really, That's messy. it is just messed up. 
Um, very human. And <laughs> basically, this it is very human, very messed up. It is uh, it is legend that really is not specifically Anglo-Saxon. It goes back to Germanic legends, um, and so you'll find echoes in Norse mythology. You'll find echoes in some stuff I've heard in Danish. You'll find echoes even in uh, Wagner's Ring Cycle. You will hear a lot of this. Um, and it is uh, background material. Um, so you will see a lot of this emphasized in poetry. Wow, that was a long aside. Um, religious things. Riddled. Riddles. Historic events not covered by war and battle. And laments. Laments is funny. Um, okay, so singing. Here's the thing. There is a debate about whether or not Anglo-Saxon poetry was sung. I am personally of the opinion that we do have enough information based on extant writings, even if it's stories about stories. I think that we have enough writing extant to say Anglo-Saxon poetry was indeed sung. Um, I don't think that we have enough to, to necessarily say it was sung with accompaniment. We know that they had harps. And we do have the story of Cademan's hymn, where we know that they passed a harp around. So we can infer from that that probably, at least at some point, they did play, you know, they were either accompanied or accompanied themselves. Um, we also know for the fact there are both people who, this is their profession, the Gleoman or the Shuk, um, which means Glee man. Mirthman, or Shop, which, depending on who you talk to, has its root in shaping. But I've also heard other things. I just happen to forget what the other allegations on what Shop actually comes from. C, um, S C O P, Shop, um, which apparently is related to shape. Again, depending on who you talk to. Um. Etymologists also like to have geeky discussions. Yay. Um, so those are the, the, the so we, we don't know, but I think we can infer that it can be sung. That problem comes up also um, in other cultures when the farther back you go. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, for the troubadour and troubert genre, uh, same issue. Christopher Page, one of the scholars in that area, has written that yeah, we have the stories, and so-and-so took the harp, and then they tuned it, and they played, and then they sang. And he's like, it it seems to imply they were playing while they were singing, but maybe they just played an intro, and then they sang without playing. He says, it's not clear which one it is. So we can't definitively say. Um, and I'm sure that's the same issue. Here. Yes. It implies it, but it doesn't definitively state it. So, yeah. We also don't know what kind of music they had. Um, because especially they did not notate music. Um, <clears throat> and the thing is, is that we do know that they did both plain chant and polyphonic chant. Um, really? yes, that, that is something that is mentioned, um, still in the Anglo-Saxon period. Um... I, I would have to actually hunt the references because this was this is one of those deep dives. So you know when you're researching, and I found that one of the best places to start a research, as opposed to the card catalog, I honestly start my research in two places, three places: Google, yeah, Amazon, simply because they do have a lovely array of books to start out from, and Wikipedia. It is great. The, I don't like Wikipedia's articles by them in and of themselves. No, I go to the end, go to the bibliography, and then exactly. I go from there, and you can take that journey yes. far. That's how I started my journey. Got one yeah. book, looked at it, the bibliography, then bought more books. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Also, when I was um, when I was starting out, as I said, uh, when I was doing this particular research, um, at that point, earlier internet, you know. Uh, started out this research like in, in 1999. 
um, is that uh, the internet was not as we know it today. Google that nice And I was, the, the, the game that I was playing on had a research list of websites that had Anglo-Saxon names and Anglo-Saxon word elements. And so I actually started there and basically went down a very, several deep rabbit holes um, and found that. And then when I finally got a hold of Howell Chickering's um, Beowulf, um, just just um, a, an amazing wealth of material in that book. Um, so there are lots of translations of Beowulf. I have like four translations of Beowulf. If you are a Beowulf fan, Okay. Yes, tell us which one's not to read. The one you do not want to read is Seamus Haney. Ah, okay, because I have it, but I haven't read it. Uh, okay, here's It's beautifully the, written. It is beautifully <laughs> written for an Irish poem. Oh. <laughs> okay. My favorite translation um, happens to honestly be the Howell Chickering, uh, uh, because although it is not, it is written in verse... It is a dual language, the Anglo-Saxon on one side, uh, an annotated translation on the other side, done in verse form. And while it does not keep the alliteration because it's, it, it does, it does not force it, but it keeps very much of the rhythm to it. So when you're reading it, and he also tends to use words of a more Germanic um, <coughs> uh, uh, um, etymology so that when you can, you're getting words, you know. Um, How's Tolkien's compare? Did you ask about Tolkien's? Tolkien's. Yeah. His notes are the greatest. Yes. His translation's probably the most literal which makes it very dry and not very enjoyable to read. It, At least that's what I found. It's not oh, okay. verse. It's number one. It's not verse form. It's it's prosy. Well, well you, you to be a literal translation. Yeah, you, you can't keep the poke. Well, yeah. I mean, you can. You just have to rearrange the. You know, the the exactly. other problem with it is it's very Victorian flavored. I mean, you know, or Edwardian flavored. That's what <laughs> accurate. Um. Yeah. If, if I want to read, if I want to read Anglo-Saxon verse from Tolkien, I'm not going to read Beowulf. You're going to read the Lord of the Rings. I'm going to read the Lord of the Rings um, yeah. because it's much more Beowulfy than his Beowulf. Interesting. Um, and and again, yes, his notes are amazing. I would love to read a really good translation of Beowulf with his notes attached to it. Okay. Okay, the, the other two, if you want an interesting take, <laughs> the bro version, whose name I am blanking on right now. Oh, I've heard about that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Although, I mean, although there are some things where I go, okay, that's a little bit too far for me. It, there are some things in there that are a little bit makes sense. weird to understand. But the interpretation she gives is that this is basically a story that these dudes are telling, like, this is their no shit, there I was story. That's right. And it really broadened an understanding of, of Beowulf and the kind of formality that might not have really been in there. Yeah. I liked that. I just got two new versions um, that are both uh, translated by women that have more feminist overtones to them, that they're giving the women more of a voice in there. Nice. Have not read either one of them, so I, I, okay. I have not written them down. So it's it's mo so the one that is it's Maria. I'm blanking on the name. I have to write. That's like one of my things. I did not have time to do is to actually go look up the best Beowulfs. Oh. Um, so. Um, the Alexander translation is okay. It's, it's actually, it's, it's dry, but not like super dry. It's just, you know, it's, it's very serviceable. Um, I read one ages ago, it was just a little penguin one. 
I don't know which one. <laughs> Um, most of the penguin ones are, are at least going to be, uh, are at least going to be solid. Yeah, I got through. <laughs> they usually get good, good yeah, colors. Yeah, I haven't gotten work. through any of the others yet. Yeah, um, but, but my overwhelming, my overwhelming, um, my overwhelming recommendation is go with the Chickering one. Uh, the notes are, like, worth their, especially he has a second annotation, which has even more than the first annotation. So even though in storage I have my first annotation, I have at home my, my second annotation. Um, so, yeah, go with that. Um, uh, and then, you know, uh, but definitely go with the, I'd say read the bro one. It's not for everyone. Um, but it is probably the most un I'm unusual. not familiar with it. How do you spell it? Um, the R... Oh, bro. No, that's no, how it, That's the opening line. That's it. Bro. Instead of oh, okay. The chance is bro. Um, Actually, you can, if you don't want to do it right now, I can give you my email and I'd like... I can do it right now, actually. I'd like to know the other so authors, the, the new translations that are by women I'd like to be. Um, yeah, you know what? Um, just send me... Uh, you got my email now. Oh, yes. Um, so just go ahead and email me your name and I will, I will tell you. Okay, so it is by... Um, Maria, uh, yeah, it's the Headley, H-E-A-D-L-E-Y. It's the Headley translation, <clears throat> and that is one where it basically is translating it into very modern, young modern um, English. And so understand it's like the word oh. version of the Bible. It's kind <laughs> the of the Gen Z vernacular of the Bible. Yeah, it is. It is. There's... So if you are if you are fairly internet conversant, you'll probably be able to scan most of it. Um, and but... I just I just say that because it's a whole different flavor, and really made me hate Unfirth less than I used to. Um. You know what? I just put Bro Beowulf translation in here. Yeah. <laughs> and an article on uh, a review on Vox came up and with the name yeah. of the author. I I just messaged you on Facebook with the graphic novel version that I came across most recently. It's, it's called Bible. The uh, Wolf. Oh, uh, that it's one. It's really I cute. Is it yeah. the Australian one? It's about it's, a girl. It's about uh, it's children. Oh, like, cool. Uh, they okay. have a tree house that they're having to protect, and it's really adorable. So, oh, that uh, is I awesome. I sent it to you, the, like, Amazon links. So you Especially because they said that, that it yeah. might, tra Beowulf might translate as the wolf. So that was yes. one of the reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, really some cute. people say it might actually mean bear, that it might be a kenning. Yeah. Um. So, now I have this little thing in here that I have, and this is... Not uh, not something that I got from the books. This is something that I've done from writing my own Anglo-Saxon verse. And that's called Making It Yours. First thing, know the form. Learn the form. Okay. Understand the form. And then learn when to break it. Okay, because there are times that you are going to want to break it. Um, but know why, when, and how to break it so that you're just not writing bad poetry and then pretending that you meant to do that. We're not cats. Okay. Ooh, I slammed into the wall. I meant to do that. That's a cat thing, you people. <laughs> I know that every single one of you is a monkey in a human suit, so don't do it. <laughs> My middle son's a cat. He used to... We just said he had real low perception because he would used to actually bump into walls when he was younger. Right, it's like he right. didn't see it. So, <laughs> how do you make this yours? One of the things I'm find is finding that if you want to build feeling, emotion, tension, themes, repeat. Repeat words, repeat phrases, repeat half lines, whole lines, repeat themes, etc. This is kind of like the uh, internal rhyme. Uh, internal rhyme, but again, when we're talking about, say, for example, Lord of the Rings, ride now, ride now, ride to Gondor. You can't not hear that and feel that. Ride now, ride now, ride to Gondor. And I'll actually read an example. Internal rhyme. Anglo-Saxon verse <clears throat> does not rhyme, except for way late in period. It does not rhyme. If you feel like you need to rhyme, 
slap your own hand. <laughs> Just don't do it. Unless you're making an internal rhyme in the middle of a line and you're rhyming it like in the middle of the next line. Fine, do that. That works. That's cool. But please, don't end rhyme. Just don't do it. Verses. Um, there is one very famous poem called Deor. Deor, if you're not familiar with it, is this dude. And he is doing, it is the lament, and he laments about all these terrible things that happened. Wayland got abused. His family gets killed. That past this will too. So and so, this happened to them, and this happened to them, and there was war, and it was terrible. That past this will too. Oh, she was, you know, she was mauled and abused and, 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 you know, men did terrible things to her. That passed. This will too. Dude, my Lord decided to fire me and he gave my job to somebody else. That passed. This will too. This dude is just basically writing this whole thing about how he lost his job. And that is somehow equal to Wayland. He wrote a country song. He wrote a country song. Now, mind you, losing your sponsor in Anglo-Saxon England was a lot worse. Well, you know what? No. I would say that, but then I look at our country today, and this is not a political comment, but let's face it, if you lose your job, so, you know, yes, we have unemployment, and they didn't really, but, you know, then they had, you know, people who oftentimes would take them in. Um, or the church would feed you. The church would feed you, so... Okay, but still, the point of the matter is, is that this guy is somehow saying that him losing out to this other shop is somehow just as bad as Wayland. Wayland the Smith. Wayland the Smith. Wow. Yes. Um. So it's it's. I love it when I really sat there and thought about it. I'm just checking time to make sure we have time. Good. We still have a half an hour. Oh, it's starting at one o'clock. Oh, I have. Oh, you're one and a half hours. Yes. Oh, cool. <laughs> okay. I thought oh yeah. Otherwise, I would not be having this leisurely discussion. Does anyone have any questions or comments while I've, I've stopped for a moment here? Okay. I was just thinking about the real purpose of, of rhyme in Anglo-Saxon verse is to make a debate for the next one thousand years whether you meant to do it or it was an accident. <laughs> yes. Precisely. Because like I said, every scholar, I think there are a lot of different theories about everything, including specific lines of poetry about whether it was the intention of the poet so, to write it that way. You know what we really need to, way, especially <laughs> since, you know, we still write this, what we really want to do. Okay. Do you want to mess with a scholar? Do Anglo-Saxon verse. Do a certain amount. Now, as I was saying, Deor is one of those few things that we know actually has verses. The reason is, is because it has a repeating chorus. Yeah. That passed this will too. Thus of a rode, this is swamite. Pardon the mutilation of Anglo-Saxon there. Thus of a rode, this is swamite. That passed this will too, more or less. Okay, Anglo-Saxon verse pretty much does not have choruses. It does not get broken up into verses. This does. And again, it's a litany of terrible things. It's lemony snicket for Anglo-Saxon times. It is a litany of terrible things. That past this will too. So the last one is about himself. I noticed it's twice the length. Of yes. The oh yeah, not only that, but he gets the star position. <laughs> I mean, this guy was like a primo bard of bards. He was arrogant because he gives more time to himself than... than, than so Wayland he must have actually been a bard then. Yeah. <laughs> well, he was. That's the thing. Is That's how he lost his position. Oh. Um, because he was being too... Yeah. Uh, other things you want to do is repeat alliteration. Um, if you're going to repeat a lot... If you're going to repeat um, alliteration across multiple lines, this thing probably has intensity and importance. So look at that. 
So if you want to mess with the scholar, what you want to do is write your Anglo-Saxon verse, put rhymes in there, and put some six-line verses in there, and then just throw it out there. Um, it, it'll just mess with people. And then, but do it on purpose, because otherwise they'll think you just suck at writing poetry. So it has to make sense. So, examples. They are. I am not going to read this because I mutilate the Anglo-Saxon. Mm. But if you look here, you can see, you can see the, the alliteration. Yeah. <clears throat> um, this one I will read for you. Y'all can read it, but you, I want you to hear this out loud because it's, it's a modern, it's the ride of the Rohirrim. But the thing is, is that he breaks this. So this is uh, from Lord of the Rings. Yeah. From dark Donharo in the dim morning, with Thane and Captain rode Thangle's son, to Edoras he came, the ancient halls of the Mark Wardens, mist and shrouded. Golden timbers were in gloom mantled. Farewell he bade to his free people. Hearth and high seat in the hollowed places, where long he had feasted ere the light faded. Forth rode the king, fear behind him, fate before him, field he kept he. Oaths he had taken, all fulfilled them. Forth rode Theoden, five nights and days. East and onward rode the Arlengus, through Fold and Fenmarch and the Firian Wood, six thousand spears to sunlending. Munberg the mighty under Mindeluin, sea king's city in the south kingdom. Foe beleaguered, fire encircled. Doom drove them, darkness took them. Horse and horsemen, hoofbeats afar, sank into silence. So the songs tell. got that cadence of hoofbeats in there. You've got these repeated sounds over and over where he's doing twice in a row or he's skipping one line and then going back to that alliteration. So there's this intensity there that just builds. Um, and that's the kind of thing that you can do in your poetry as well. Uh, this was when I wrote. So the F, he keeps bringing the F rhyme. He back. brings that. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I have some repetition in this one. This is me, because I'm arrogant, but at least mine is shorter than, um, <laughs> uh, than Deo. This is basically a Anglo-Saxon verse about, um, about, Beol, or about uh, Grendel's mother. Huh? She will hear you. Hear the loud din, the crush and clash and cry of battle. Beer tables broken, benches upturned, as fell in fierce the foe you grapple does shout and scream and shake the ground as rending, ripping, reaching for you his luck is lost and lost as well his arm, his bone, his baneful claw. Now moaning, dying, nearward he goes. Your tongue will tell the tale of battle. She will hear you and she will come. Um, on this one, because I wanted to have intensity in the buildup, I repeat a lot of the, the alliterative words, his, his, he, 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 he. <laughs> um, but also in the end, I wanted to have a, f an unfulfilled feeling. Um, in other words, this is a warning. So I did the bare minimum of alliteration in this. She will hear you and she will come. And that's it. I don't even use a different um, alliterative. Now, this is the one thing that not everyone knows about Anglo-Saxon verse. Two important things. All vowels. Alliter no. All vowel sounds alliterate with all other vowel sounds. So, ax and eddy are going to alliterate. Ax and eddy and iceberg all alliterate. Yes. Ox and ax also alliterate, which is cool because then you get a back, uh, 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 ox and ax would be nice because then you've also got rep repetition. The other thing, vowel combinations 
do not necessarily alliterate. There's a weak alliteration and then a strong alliteration. So, for example, silver and she do not alliterate. Sh is a different sound than s. Oh, oh, okay, sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's sort of the same letter. It's the sound right. that it's matters, sound. not the... Exactly. It, because it developed as an oral sure. form. Right. Yeah. I, I, thought, I thought you were saying the vowels in them didn't alliterate. Right. I misheard. You no, know, because you're not doing a vowel. The, the, it, if the vowel is, is the starting sound of that beat, then yes. So, for example, ox, onward. Those are all, you know, ox onward, apple. Onward we go to eat Very, the apples. Rarely we joined up with, like, the schwa sound, the uhs. Yeah. In there. I mean, you might, you might, but it really depends. You know, uh is not usually against. No, again, against, 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 against. So, hey, yeah, hey, uh hey. is not usually. What One theory I heard is because it's not that the word is starting with the vowel. It's a glottal stop. Well, or, or just a missing consonant. Yeah. yeah. Um, also because most vowels tend to be in the same region, um, so they feel very much the same. So now here's the funny thing is some vowel sounds are, you know, some vowels are actually like, yeah, oh, that's really a consonant there. So the other thing, what are your thoughts on steel and sword? So, as, as long as you're consistent within your 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 own, yeah. So here's the basic thing: is that there are debates on whether or not there are some that they just don't do. I think I wrote some of them down here. Eh, probably not. Um, again, because it's a debate thing, and I didn't want to put all the debates in here. No. <laughs> so some vowel combinations like s strength. Even like strength and steel. Okay, that's pretty good. But the closer you can align them, the stronger the alliteration is. So you're going to have some that's weak alliteration, and you're going to have some that's strong alliteration. In my opinion, you should not alliterate steel and swan. Even though they both have the initial s steel. It's like more... Yeah. Yeah, because Solid. it's st, it's st and s. You know, you still get the s, but there's that w that's connected to it. You know, swift. Swift the steel struck the swan. There we go. Yeah. So the last thing on structure on this, there are four variant alliterative stress um, patterns. And remember, the third. Beat always has to alliterate unless you've deliberately broken the line we won't talk about when you accidentally screwed up and didn't do it. I don't know what we're talking about there because I've never done that. Okay. First and third. Second and third. First, second, and third. And then all. All of them is not in general use. The reason for this, it is actually seen as a poor form. We don't really see it pretty much ever in extant like verse. I mean, it's just not done because it is overkill. Um, it, it comes out sounding kind of childish, actually, and very sing-songy, and you just don't want to do that. The other thing you'll notice is that you will not see a pattern of XX34. The reason for this is that you have to have one alliterative sound in each half line. So 3-4 just is not going to cut it. Um, so any questions about that before we hit riddles? Um, two other things is that Penguin has this lovely, it's a translation, but it's the earliest English um, it's a really old, uh, it's, it's a really old release of theirs. Like I got it back in the eighties. Um, however, it is a lovely, uh, it is a lovely selection of different 
it goes all the way from uh, Beowulf to the Battle of Brunbra, Brun, the, the, and um, uh, Bjort. Thank you. Um, my brain isn't braining again. So Bjornoth and and uh, uh, Bronswell and also it's got Widsith in there. It's got um, the Mariner. It's got um, and it's got parts of Judith in there. Anyway, it's really good, and it also has some riddles. So Anglo-Saxon riddles. Um, as I've said before, uh, from what we can tell, they are used as a form of entertainment. By the way, if we look at the story of... How many of you are familiar with the story of Cade Munson? Cade Munson. I've heard of it. Okay. So basically, this is... This is something that is um, uh, told by the venerable-ish bead. Um, uh, I, I can... I can do a whole thing on bead and my love of him. Um, but uh, one of the things that he does is he tells a story about this shepherd. Uh, well, shepherd, uh, cowherd. Uh, you know, I've, again, seen both translated. Um, a herder. Um, who is in the hall with everyone, and the harp is being passed around, and every time that the harp gets near him, he decides to go out in the barn with the animals because he does not want to perform. Yeah. Um, so obviously we can tell that <coughs> Anglo-Saxon verse or, or, you know, singing or whatever is they had their own variant of bardic circles. They would pass a harp around and you'd be expected to play. So finally he has a dream. And in this dream, he sings this poem to God. And it's about the creation and how wondrous it is. It's actually a very, um, it, you know, I'm not that specific religion, but I also find it beautiful. Um, it, it is uh, really lovely. And uh, so I, I highly recommend to look it up. Um, if you get a chance to hear it in Anglo-Saxon, it's really pretty. I probably have heard it. Um, it's been back to perform. Yeah, I was going to say, also, if you get a chance, listen to the entirety of Benjamin Bagby's Beowulf, because it is just amazing. Seen him twice. Once was I, I would, years ago. I would not kill to see him live um, um, performing that, but I, I might. It's on CD now. If you or had DVD. had Bardic Madness to go to two weeks ago, he was up in Milwaukee doing oh. it. I know. Yeah, it was, it was a bad conflict. Schedule wise. Excuse me a moment. He'll do it again. I know, but you do not see me doing this. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. anyway, so we have this lovely thing where he's performing and he comes back, and the next time the harp is passed around, he performs this and then they make a monk out of him. I mean, you know, guess. Or at least they hire him to write more verses. And they hire him to write, <laughs> write more verses. It's again, this is Bead, so take everything yeah. Bead says with like a ginormous, like an entire salt? boatload of salt. Yeah. Um, but this, this is one of those things where, although the some of the smaller details might be fudged, this rings very true. You know, it's a, it's a very, it's one of the really human stories that he tells. <clears throat> you know, where it's, it's not like grandy, it, yes, you know, it's like, he, he's, 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 you know, he's priestly, he's wanting to glorify his God, that's cool. But the story itself just has such a ring of, of truth to it, um, that it just doesn't come across like a lot of his tall tales. Um. So I think from a historical perspective, I would trust the, the uh, I would trust at least the handing the harp around. Just to, to me, how I evaluate history. And again, there is a whole, there are classes and classes that are out there about how to evaluate history. Um, because it, it is not just simply, it was written as history, therefore it is. 
<laughs> what was um, the agenda of the writer? Exactly. Um, but it, it, like I said, that really had a ring of truth. You know, was, was it like, did he, did he write that specific poem? Did he write those specific words? I don't know. Maybe. Well, B gives it to us in a Latin translation, so right. They, so he didn't they, write the Latin words. But so, the, but the, so it's the only this first one we have is a translation of the translation. Right. <laughs> well, actually, the Anglo-Saxon part was written in Anglo-Saxon. It was, was translated it from the. <laughs> okay, it was translated from Latin. So who knows? But we at least have the passing around the harp. You know that is pretty. All right, riddles. Who here has actually heard an Anglo-Saxon riddle before? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Okay. So again, we are not talking about. What did I give for this one? Yeah. So basically, here's my thing: is is we're not talking about when is a door not a jo door. When it's a jar. Yeah. We are not talking about that sort of riddle. How I like to look at riddles is riddles are kind of like an extended kenning where you actually have to guess what the kenning actually means. <laughs> um, so basically, if you're looking at it, what it is, is a lot of the, most of the riddles, some of them don't, but a general standard that you can look at for a riddle for creating it or evaluating it is it starts out broadly and then starts narrowing down things. It's going to be listing more facts or it's going to be like removing contingencies and stuff. So hopefully you will be left with what this is. Not always. Um, again, if you've read The Hobbit, the riddle game, those are the sorts of riddles we're going with. Now, again, we have one book of extant riddles. And it's not even the entire book. It is a whole section in the Exeter book. Fun thing. Number one, it is written, like most of Anglo-Saxon literature verse, line after line after line after line after line. So, not only... Again, not only do we have to decide, looking at the alliteration, where each line begins and ends, but there's not a division between one riddle and the next. <clears throat> so the number of riddles, it's somewhere in the low hundreds, like 105, 110. The exact number of riddles that we have, they're not even 100% sure of because whoever is translating it, they're... Uh, Oh. Like three or four that kind of run one into the other. So they're not sure if this is two riddles or one. Or they're not sure if this ver or this line belongs to this verse or this verse. Or this riddle or this riddle. The other thing is. The Exeter book. While it was very kind, thank you, oh, previous people for keeping it. Did not include an answer guide. <laughs> so... So we're guessing. So we're guessing. Um, some of them were pretty clear, but others... Like, um, so just be aware that not every single riddle is going to actually have a, a, a riddle listed. Okay, now there is this lovely book called The Meat Hall uh, by Stephen Paulington. Uh, I think it's technically out of print, but it's, it's, a, um, it's a book that you can find... Stephen Paulington is, is one of those authors I really recommend for Anglo-Saxon history because he's done a lot of good research. He's got a lot of stuff out there. Um, and he doesn't tend to put in... If he's got hidden agendas, they don't seem to be particularly visible. Um, especially when you're getting into things like When you're getting into the history of Anglo-Saxon uh, or Old English um, literature, again, I'm going to make this, this caveat too. I say Anglo-Saxon because that's how I've been teaching it for years and years. There is a, um, 
there is a somewhat more recent push because Anglo-Saxon, the term off and on gets co-opted by racists. So elephant in the room. Um, if you hear people starting to use Old English, it's because that has not yet been as co-opted. Um, so if people ask you to use Old English as a term, fine. Um, it's, it's again, something that, uh, I'd rather use that term if it gets really to the point of this term is only being used by racists. Um, and the reason I say that is also because if you're reading, um, you know, some less scholarly writings about Anglo-Saxon England, if you're reading it about Anglo-Saxon religion, um, if you're reading it about Anglo-Saxon runes and magic, those are big areas, and, and even cultures, those, those are big areas where you're going to find a lot of hidden agendas, both by, you know, pe people of various different faiths that want to prove that there was some... Something. Some something. Yeah. Um, or, you know, this... Uh, Anglo-Saxon England only had this sort of people in it. No, it didn't. You know. Um, so, look at your sources. Um, just look at them long and hard. See what kind of research they have in the back. Um, I, I just want to bring that up because it's, it's something that is becoming more and more noticeable. It's popular, right? It's popular right now. Paulington is, is a person that I, I really have seen to trust his research. Uh, it seems to be pretty solid. Um, so in the Mead Hall, he talks about all sorts of things about the, the Lord or King's Mead Hall and how it was a focal point of civilized culture. Um, and... Uh, talks about different aspects. Riddles come out there. So he lists a whole bunch of categories of riddles. Uh, I don't think we really need to read through all of these. Um, the one that uh, we don't really see in Anglo-Saxon verse, but is pretty famous, is the neck riddle. Um, and that is found in, actually, you'll find that in Norse mythology, because the neck riddle is basically a riddle that uh, only the person who tells the riddle can possibly know the answer. And oftentimes it is given at a point where if you do not answer this, you are going to die. <laughs> um, the famous one in Norse mythology is Odin was really ticked off at a king. So he goes and he visits them as Grimnir, the one-eyed. And, uh, basically because this dude was a bad host. And, uh, so they're having a riddle game. And at the end, Odin says, What did Odin whisper into Baldur's ear at Baldur's funeral? Yeah. That's when the king realized that his guest was Odin, and oh, he was in deep doo-doo. <laughs> you can't say, I don't know, that's not allowed. Nope. That's not fair. That's not a technical answer. You know, not once, once you've agreed that you're going to give an answer. Yes. Right. A word, something like words would be the bardic answer. Oh. Technically not wrong. Right. Right. Um, and I have to, you know, I have to know that Odin, he, he you know, appreciates cleverness and that. So words. I'd say words in, in this language. I wouldn't use it. I'd just be like words. Okay, just because, you know. He probably would laugh and you would live. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hopefully. Which is why it is good if you're dealing with gods, know that you're wanting to call on your bardic wise assery. Just not too much of it. All right. Um, and the other neck riddle that most of us are familiar with is what has it got, or what have I got in my pockets? Yeah. Um, so. I don't have pockets. I have portable boxes, right? This is just a pocket. I have a wagon. Yeah. I don't even wear pockets a anymore. I got my pockets, actually. Um, 
I always find weird. Uh, I have a music note. Ah. Uh, just have a little note. Put it back. Yeah. It's a sight token for Bardic Madness. Yeah, I was. I was, no, the sight token for Bardic Madness was um uh was the Shakespearean insult. Card. Oh right. It, I know I got one as a sight token recently. <laughs> okay. Um. So these are. The other amusing, the other amusing one, especially when you think that most of these were written down by monks. Is that there are a lot of double entendre riddles in this? Like, there's a lot of mean. penis pictures drawn by nuns in the marginalia. Oh, yeah. There's a lot. A lot. Yes. <laughs> Weird. Yeah. It's well, I, I. It's a thing. This is being recorded, so you're not getting my commentary on this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am a wondrous thing, woman's delight. Handy in the home, I harm no householder but him who hurts me. My stalk is tall, I stand in bed, my root rather hairy. The haughty girl, churl's gorgeous, gorgeous daughter, sometimes has courage to clasp me. Rushes my redness, rapes my head, stows me in her stronghold. Straight away the curly locked maiden who clamps me, weeps at our wedding, wet is her eye. Now what is this? Yeah, we've heard this one. Well, I think yes. It's probably the most popular of all the fiddles. Yeah. Ashley, this is I would me. say it's it's the double it's entendre of two different answers, right? Yes, it is. But what is the answer? The official nice good answer? Yeah, the official nice An good answer. Onion. An onion. Um one of the other ones that I am uh that I'm familiar with that I, I can't remember like exactly, you know, is, is um I am a wondrous thing that dangles below a man's, uh, a man's belt. He takes me in his hand and thrusts me in that hole that he has oft filled before. Key. Yeah, it's a key. <laughs> but. <laughs> or not. <laughs> or not. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is really. We're, we're letting them, because uh, they're here for the next class, well, we have five minutes in which to leave and, and, and get out of here. So, does anyone have any final questions? Comments? Oh, 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 um, there is also if... One, two, three, at four attendees, I'll count you, Kiriam. Yeah, that's right, you got to count. He is here. Okay. Is I do have not enough of these. Oh, oh we yeah. were supposed to give those to people. I thought yeah, they're like a for survey us, like, for other people's. All right, I'm just. Oh, I'm just, oh okay. So I've been them. To I people. see. Yeah. It could be that you write when you attend someone else. Yeah. Class. So if anyone would like to to pass in the, don't forget that there is an anonymous. You are. So I guess it goes into there. So. If you would like to evaluate me and tell me how much I need to work on this, go right ahead. Um, I really appreciate you. If there's, if there is something that you would, if there is something you'd like me to cover, please feel free because as as you've seen on here, I update this every few years or so, and I would be more than happy to do more updates. Does anyone want more copies since I have it? Does anyone want more copies to take home for their friends, neighbors, and enemies? Or does anyone need kindling? I don't have a copy in the first place I, if you're offering kindling. Oh, <laughs> I'd keep them for the next time I taught it. It is, it is my Anglo-Saxon alliterative verse class. So thank you. Cool. Feel free. So, thank you for coming. I'm uh, yes. very glad Did that you, you, you came. Thank you for teaching. My pleasure. Sure. If I'd gotten here earlier, I would have been here for all of you.